Unlike many national parks, you'll need a ferry reservation, and your day will start at the ferry company instead of the visitor center. Most sailings overlap with visitor center hours, so if you want to pay them a visit, you'll probably stop in the days before or after your trip. It's a great resource to assist in planning, and also a good place to get answers on any questions that come up during your visit. The ferry office is not as elaborate as a visitor center, but also houses some good information, including a cool board that details how many whales and dolphin sightings there have been. We had a perfectly smooth sail across with no wildlife, other than seabirds, but I can happily live with that trade. After disembarking, the rangers will collect you in a group and give you a brief orientation. Often they offer free guided walks, which are usually a lot of fun, but we didn't have time for one today. The trail to Potato Harbor had pretty minimal elevation gain, but most of what it had was all at once. The harbor is near the bottom of Scorpion Canyon, so for most trails, other than the one towards the campground, you must start out by climbing out of that canyon. As we rose above the walls, the view of the ocean and the island landscape grew. The lush greener of spring is really striking. This time between winter and summer is short, and the summer sun quickly bakes the island, turning much of this lush landscape golden. This is one of the many ravens on the island. These birds are very clever and are masters at manipulating things with their beaks. In some places, ravens use tools, but on this island, they're purported to be zipper wizards. And while they might prefer food, they are curious and willing to play with just about anything they might find. The park provides critter safe boxes for day hikers near the harbor to keep everyone safe. We made Potato Harbor our lunch spot. The high cliff walls make the water unreachable by anyone without a boat. It's a funny place because it feels like a secluded private beach, but depending upon the day, sunbathers below might be serving as entertainment for as many as a couple dozen people watching from above. The earth was odd. In some places it was a fine dust, and in others, moisture turned it into a sticky paste that quickly built up on my feet as I walked. Some places fine dust dried, forming a thin layer on the path that made it extremely slick, almost as if someone had sprinkled talc powder. At the visitor center, we are told this area is rich in diamaceous earth. The fossilized remains of microscopic creatures is often used as a natural pest deterrent. We felt like it had identified us as a pest, and we were very glad to have our hiking poles on the zent back to the canyon. Down in that shady oasis of those trees sits one of the campgrounds, and that was our last hope of finding the tiny island foxes. We had been keeping an eye out for them all day and hadn't spotted any yet so we crept down to the campground in hopes of not scaring them off. We soon realized that we had nothing to be worried about, as they were completely habituated to humans and were plentiful around the campground. They showed almost no fear. Someone even accidentally dropped a hiking pole near one, and it barely reacted. It was unclear why, since there was a stream nearby, but it seemed that this raven had laid claim to this water spigot. It alarmed whenever foxes passed too close, and pulled with their tails a couple of times. These cute foxes don't exist anywhere else in the world. 25 years ago, after decades of pig, horse, and sheep ranching, and small animal-eating golden eagles taking the place of fish-eating bald eagles, they nearly went extinct. Since then, with the removal of the ranch animals, the return of the bald eagles, and some help, their numbers have recovered from less than 100 to several thousand. Check out the links below for more of that story and other resources. The amenities on this island are really impressive. The pit toilets at the beach were pristine with tiled floor, sea protectors, and hand sanitizer. Maybe this doesn't sound luxurious, but of all the ones I have seen, these were the best. There's also a small building with a very comprehensive range of exhibits, including the story of the foxes. We had a little more time before the ferry back, so we hurried up Smuggler's Road on the far side of the canyon to check out the view from Scorpion Bluffs. We were the only people up there, and throughout the day, often, we could only see one other group at a time. At night, only the ranger and campers are left, which means only about 30 people for miles. Can you imagine living out here all by yourself? These islands used to be home to entire communities, with over a thousand Chumash people living on this particular island. If you've ever heard the story of the Island of the Blue Dolphins, it was inspired by a real woman who lived out on one of the more isolated islands, San Nicolas. Juan and Maria chose to stay when the rest of her village left, and for many years she and her son comfortably lived there together. It wasn't until years after her son's accidental death that she chose to leave the island, Tragically, after thriving on the island for 18 years, she lived less than a couple months after moving to the mainland.
After reaching the docks, we thought our adventure was over, but there was still one surprise waiting for us. Just off the boat ramp, a sea lion bobbed around, and it felt that it was just as curious about us as we were about it. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. There are hiking resources below and information on free ways to help support this channel. The easiest is liking and subscribing. Thank you. Happy exploring.